Hi, Miss Maria. Good afternoon. My name is Isha and I'm a high school student interested in being a veterinarian. I'm so excited to welcome you to the interview series on the careers of veterinarians. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me start with an introduction of our speaker. Our speaker today is Maria Parga. After graduating from veterinary school, she decided to devote her career to exotic veterinary medicine of wild animals. She completed a master's in wildlife health at the London Zoo and a residency in wild and exotic animal medicine at the University of Edinburgh, and then began to work with sea turtles in Mediterranean Spain. She was the head of the research center for marine animals in Barcelona for several years. Currently, she works at the marine conservation organization, Submon, of which she is a founding member. Maria specializes in rehabilitation and veterinary medicine for sea turtles, mammals, and birds. She applies her knowledge and experience especially to assessing and increasing the post-capture survival of sea animals accidentally captured by fisheries. This includes working with fishers to improve animal handling and gear removal techniques on board their vessels. In the past year, she has also focused on oiled wildlife response planning and preparedness in Europe. Thanks again for chatting with me today. Well, thank you for having me here. So first, could you please tell us about the type of work that you do? Feel free to share your screen and show any pictures or slides if you like. Okay, yes, I will share a few pictures so that you get a bit of a better idea because it's quite difficult to explain. So let me first share my screen and start the, uh, the presentation. Here, okay. So as you already as you already mentioned, um, I work mainly with sea turtles and with with fisheries. So um, I guess this would be a good picture of of what I do. Uh, I don't know if you see my cursor moving. So this would be me here. Do you see it, Isha? Yes, okay. I can see it. So that would be me here with a couple of uh, some p uh, colleagues giving me a hand. We're on a long line fishing vessel, working with sea turtles. Um, uh, here, I would be on a on a troll fishing vessel working with a sea turtle, doing an ultrasound scan on it um, to see how it's doing. Um, so I thought it was quite difficult to um, to explain really what I do and how I got there because it's not the usual thing you would expect from a veterinarian. Um, so I thought. To, to start with, I would explain how I got there, because I, I think that's the easiest uh, way of, of, of understanding what I do. For example, here, also, it's a sea turtle on a fishing vessel that has arrived with a hook lodged in the mouth. So I have a look at it. I see how the hook is, where it is, if it's better to remove it or not to remove it, how to remove it the best way so that the animal survives when it's when it's uh, released. So let me let me start with a bit of the of where I, how I got there, and um, this is basically um, back in two thousand and three. So twenty years ago, I was working in the United Kingdom, and we'll talk about that later. But because of personal reasons, I went back to Spain, where I'm from, and I went to this area. Uh, in the Mediterranean of Spain, this would be the Mediterranean Sea. So if this is Spain, this is where I went to, to Barcelona, okay, right in the Mediterranean Sea. And I went there to uh, be the, the head of a marine animal rescue center that looked mainly at uh, sea turtles. I had never worked with sea turtles before. I had worked at rescue centers, wildlife rescue centers before, but that was completely new for me. And I was there five years. Uh, the main work that we did there was uh, with sea turtles. We did see a few uh, dolphins, but usually dolphins came stranded at the beach in very poor conditions, so uh, they would all die, and it was just doing post-mortem exams on the, on the dolphins. But the main veterinary work was, was with sea turtles. Now, back then, 20 years ago, the long-line fishery in that part of, uh, of the Mediterranean Sea was very, very important. Long-line um, vessel, I, I guess you don't know what it is, but basically it's a, a, a boat and it goes a, a very, very, very long line that goes very superficial parallel to the sea surface and from it, it hangs several lines with a hook at the end of each one. And I'm talking about 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 hooks. So they're very, very long lines. They go for miles uh, and they have different size or types of hooks depending on what they want to fish. If they want to go for tuna, they smaller fish, uh, 
hooks, if they want to go for swordfish, for example, they are bigger hooks. So it depends on the type of fishery. But um, for those five years, all sea turtles I saw, or most of them came with hooks. Uh, some were brought by the fishermen when they captured them accidentally. The problem is, I mean, fishermen don't want to capture turtles. They just capture them because they are fishing in the same areas where the animals are eating. So they uh, bite the bait of the hook or they get into the nets and that's how they capture them, but they don't want to capture them at all. So they would bring them to the harbor so that we could look after the animals and remove the hooks or see that they were doing okay. Um, during that time, I also, I worked very much with fishermen uh, in trying to convince the ones that didn't to bring the animals to, to land so that we could look after the animal, uh, talk to them about how they captured the animals, how they could deal with them on board. And I also worked a lot with uh, volunteers, training them, organizing teams, giving them equipment, because we had a 200 mile long uh, coast in the region where I worked. And uh, although we were on, on call every day of the year, night or day, it would be, you know, it could take us two hours to drive to some parts of the region. So we needed volunteers closer to the place uh, that they knew how to handle the animal until we were there. So that was my, my, my job there. Now, the problem in this rescue center is we would look after about 100 sea turtles every year. But back then, in, only in the Spanish side of the Mediterranean, only the Spanish longline feed, would capture about 20,000 animals every year. So it was a very interesting job. I learned a lot. Uh, you felt you were doing something, but for me, treating 100 animals when 20,000 were being captured, it just made no sense. So I, I, I wanted to change, but I didn't know how or where to go. And I was very lucky in a, in a Congress. I was in the right place at the right time. And I met two researchers, one from San Diego, and one from Japan, and they were leading um, a, a very large uh, program to reduce bycatch of sea turtles in the Eastern Pacific, so the Pacific side of America, Central America and South America. They were trying different size of hooks and different types of hooks and different types of baits, and they had observers on board to see what was going on, but the animals were still being captured, sea turtles, so they needed a vet to help them see how to remove those hooks, how, how that could be done on a fishing vessel, not in a clinic, because that's very easy, but on a fishing vessel. So in 2007, I ended up in this vessel, fishing vessel from Ecuador. It's a long line fishing vessel, uh, smaller than the ones we have in Europe, a bit smaller than the ones you have in the United States too, but still they would, they would uh, throw about 500 to 1000 hooks every time. Um, and I spent three weeks in the middle of the Pacific with all those fish, uh, fishermen, with some fishery observers, with uh, fishery technicians. This one here and this one here were the two researchers that ha I had met. And they came with me on that fishing trip. Uh, this is a fishery observer from Ecuador, a fishery technician, uh, engineers. So to, you know, to try and, and, and solve this problem of accidental bycatch of, um, of sea turtles. And during three weeks, I just worked on board with them, looking at how the animals came to the board, how they would retrieve it, how they would deal with the hook. I would have a look at all of them, see where the hook was, see how to remove it, what injuries were left, trying to estimate um, how that would translate into a post-release uh, mortality, because obviously you need to release the animal back to sea. Uh, we were two days from, from land, so there was no way you could bring the animals back to, to harbor. That's a luxury that it, it, it doesn't very often happen. Um, so they had to be able to do something on board. Um, and I found it really interesting. I really loved the job. So I continued working like that. Uh, two years later, I went back on the, on the same boat to do a training video for all the fisheries in the Pacific of South America. And I've also been on board in Mexico, in Spain, and I also have met with a lot of fishermen in different parts of, uh, especially America and Europe. In the States, all the East Coast of the United States, I was talking and training fishermen, 
in Guatemala, in Peru, in, uh, in Mexico, in uh, uh, Costa Rica, in Panama, in Ecuador. So I have been, uh, I have experience on board. I know what are the conditions on board. I have my veterinary experience, of course, and everything I trained, and I will talk about that in a, in a, in a minute. And I also have a lot of experience from speaking to different fishermen in different parts of the world. So I can, I can see a solution that fishermen apply, for example, in Guatemala. And then when I talk to the fishermen in Peru, I can explain them and they can improve their practices based on what other fishermen do in other parts of the world. So basically that's what I do. And that's why, how, that's how I got there. I, I just, for me, working in the rescue center just wasn't enough. I wanted to really work in conservation and, and, and make a difference. And I was lucky enough to find this, uh, this kind of work that is really nice. But then it's not all so nice. Um, and uh, really this picture, I, I, could, I could put a picture, but it would be the picture of an office and a computer. I spent most of the year sitting in front of a computer writing. So it seems like it's a very interesting job and very... Uh, adventurous but really in the end there is a lot of back work in an office and I need to in order to be able to work I need to be able to find funding for my work so most of my time goes trying to find calls for proposals funding uh, organizations that will be interested to fund conservation work in the in marine animals uh, writing project proposals writing budgets uh, managing to get the funding then I go out and play with turtles or I train fishermen or I work with them and I do a few weeks of traveling every year. And then I come back to work at the office and I just have to analyze all the results, um, write reports. Uh, during the work, I also have to develop a lot of training material, training manuals, training videos. So I spend most of my time every year is sitting in front of a computer writing. Basically, that's most of it. So that's what that's what I do. Thank you so much for sharing all about your work with us. That's really amazing. And um, now I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your education and training that prepared you for this career, how it helped you, what were the prerequisites, where'd you study, and maybe if you had any influential mentors. Yeah, yeah, of course I did. Uh, yeah, I mean, my I, I went to veterinary school in Spain in a small town, um, small university, so I have no pictures of that. Um, back then, we are talking 30 years ago, that was a long time ago, um, at university, at vet school, certainly in Spain, um, we were a lot of students and there was hardly any practical work. So it was all lectures, theory, and just studying and learning everything by heart. That was my university education, that was it. Now, since I started with veterinary medicine, I, I always knew I wanted to work with wildlife. That's why I became a vet, to work with wildlife. So as soon as I finished in Spain, there were hardly any, any opportunities. So I was not staying in Spain. Uh, my English was quite good back at the time. My German was quite, quite good back at the time. So I looked for other opportunities outside of Spain in Europe. And I was very lucky to find uh, a few opportunities in the United Kingdom. So that's where I went. Um, I knew there was a master's in London, so I applied for it. And in the meantime, I went to see a two-month practice in a, in a wildlife rescue center in, in England. Uh, it was an RSPCA uh, wildlife rescue center. That's the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. I think you have the same in the United States. Um, and there it was a wildlife rescue center looking at mammals and birds, mainly all kind of wildlife, but it was very, very much focused or specialized in seals because it's very close to the, to the coast and there's some very big seal com um, colonies in the area. So it was mostly gray seal and harbor seal. And during two months, I saw practice there. Uh, this person here, this is, it's more than my mentor. I mean, it's like my professional father, Ian Robinson. I was very lucky that he was the manager and the head veterinarian in that rescue center back then. And he, he was the one that 
A, encouraged me to stay in the United Kingdom and stay working there until I, I managed to go to do the, the master's that I wanted to do. And it got delayed by one year. So I had one year and a half ahead of me. And he convinced me to, to, to stay in the United Kingdom and, and work there, which was a great decision. But more than that, he, he was the one uh, during those two months, but then over a few more months, because he employed me uh, there when I, when, I, um, when I decided I was going to stay in the United Kingdom, he basically managed to bring everything that I had in my head from the studies and the learning by heart at university to bring it down to earth and actually see how to apply it to real veterinary medicine. So he is the one that actually taught me veterinary medicine. I I did all surgery. I started doing surgery with him. I mean, I left university without having taken a blood sample from an animal. Imagine how little I knew about veterinary medicine. And back there, he would let me do all the surgery. Uh, he, he, he took me through the process of all, how you do a, a full diagnosis, how you do a proper treatment, how basically how to, yeah, how to structure everything that I had in my head, but I had I was I was never told how to use it or what it was all worth for, and suddenly during my months there, I realized how to apply it, how how it actually everything made sense, and how uh, if structured in the right way, actually it would allow me to do veterinary medicine and to know what a seal with a snotty nose. Uh, to actually find out what was the problem and how to treat it and eventually how to release it back to the wild. So for me, everything I am now, I, I owe to him. That's for sure. And we still are very good friends. Uh, we still see each other every so often. He works in the state. He lives in the States right now. And we still work together because he also works in wildlife conservation. So we've done a few projects together. So uh I really, he was a big change um, in my life. And I think everything that I am now, I owe him, I owe it to him for sure. So I was really lucky that I found this place and I got to spend some months here. I also spent that year and a half in the, in the UK. I also did some uh, small animal clinics and I was very good to, 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 to really settle my, my base. All the, everything I had learned at university to, to, to get my head in a veterinary medicine way, if you want, I found it really useful to, to see a lot of cases um, and, and get practice in all that. So it was very, very useful to do some small animal clinic. And that would be for anybody going into clinics, even if you want to do wildlife, but at least for a few months to see a lot of clinics and and, and get your basic veterinary medicine settled so that, so that you can then can build on that, but you have that really well settled and, and well fixed. I don't know how to say it in, in English, but yeah, that, that would be the idea to, to get your, get your ideas and everything that you learned really, really settled. And then you can expand your knowledge if you want. But I thought that was, that was really good. And from there, I went to do a one year's masters on wildlife health and conservation in London at London Zoo. Um, and uh, there were two things that I would take from these masters. Uh, it was really interesting. We got to do a lot of different things, uh, see a lot of things related to wildlife conservation, to clinics, to surgery, how to look after animals at the zoo, how to look after animals in the wild. Mm, but for me, the two key things that I got from masters was first, the people that I um, studied with, we were 15 uh, vets, Student, well, students that were vets. Most of us had some sort of experience in wildlife. We came from 13 different countries. So it was people from all over the world. And uh, more than the lectures themselves, what I found really interesting was to, to get to know all these people, to their backgrounds, the, the way they thought of different aspects, the points of view, what, what their work was. Uh, one would work in a zoo, but the other one would work with Ethiopian wolf to try and conserve it in Ethiopia. Another one would work with the conflict of cattle and wildlife in in Namibia, for example. Um, so it was very different wildlife veterinarians. So that was really nice to see. And the other thing that was very useful, uh, these masters, was to meet people to get, uh, they, they would get all the experts that happened to be in London, they would ask them to please come and give us a talk. So 
we saw many different uh, vets and non-vets, biologists, also working in conservation that came to speak to us. Uh, we, we were very few, so we actually got to know them a bit, to speak to them, to have a beer after the talk or, you know, so very informal. So we could make a lot of contacts. And for me, staying in Europe to work, that was really important because then that allowed me uh, to easily go to my next step, which was a three-year residency at Edinburgh University. Um, and uh, that was, I was a student still, of course, that was a residency. Um, during three years, I was at the exotic and wildlife um, medical department. It was me and three other veterinarians that would would be my, my, my teachers, if you want. And then I would have a group of five final year students always behind me, following me everywhere in the in the hospital. And that was really, that was a great time because I, I really had to get up to speed and learn. I was, I keep thinking, I don't know how I got into this because I didn't have enough experience. I had never worked with exotics before. Uh, but when I got the opportunity, I just jumped at it. Again, I'm very good at jumping at opportunities. I don't really think much about what I'm doing and how it's going to work. Um, and it worked well. I had to work a lot because um, those final year students would ask many questions and I had to know the answers for all of them. So that made me really, I, I you know, the time I wasn't working at the clinic, I was studying, uh, which was really good. And I, I, uh, it, it improved my skills with exotic. We, we would have the exotic animal clinic and it was a referral center for the north of England and for all of Scotland. Uh, we would be the vets for the rescue center of the area, which obviously I would do because I already had experience in wildlife rescue centers. And we were the vets for the Edinburgh Zoo. So, you know, in a single day, you could have, well, a, 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 a rabbit coming for a dental work but you could end up with a giraffe that was giving birth and there was some problem and you had to go there or a tiger that had wounds and you had to anesthetize and, and, and stitch up the wounds or, you know, you just didn't, you knew how this, the day started, but you never knew how it would finish. Um, and at the zoo, you would have penguins also, and you would have to, you know, they had problems. Uh, they had malaria and, you know, they could have TB. There were many different things. This is a lion that came with a with a, a tumor in the tongue, tongue you say, uh, which ended up being a malignant tumor and we had to put it to sleep. Uh, the lemurs would fight all the time. So you were always called out to, to stitch up a lemur, for example. So it was it was three years that I really, after the three years, I, I did consider myself a, an expert in wildlife and exotic animal medicine. It, it, I really learned a lot during those three years. And because I was the, the resident, I got to see all the, diff the difficult cases. I got to do all the surgery, which I loved. So I really became quite good in surgery too. Um, and, and, you know, for my training, that was the, the, the in, Span in Spain, we say the guinda sobre el pastel. It's like the cherry on the, on the cake. It was like, yes, it was perfect. It was... For me, my training evolution, it just, just went step by step. I didn't plan it. It just happened. But for me, it, it worked really well. And each moment of the training gave me different skills and different attitudes. Uh, and by the end of those three years, I was ready uh, to do whatever. And that's when, for personal reasons, I, ha I, I, I went back to Spain and I started working at the Marine Animal Rescue Center. That that was really incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. It was it was it's really helpful to for someone at my stage to kind of understand what to expect in the future. Mm -hmm. So now could you discuss about how your career evolved over time, including some skills and experience that you learned during your fascinating journey, the best career decision you made, any setbacks that turned out to be an advantage, and any considerations as you made different choices in your career. Yeah. Um, for that, I have no pictures because it's really the ones that I've already shown through my training and my career. But what I would take from the different moments or what, what I learned from the different moments, um, definitely, um, I think 
a very good career decision for me was to do the residency on exotic and wild animal medicine that, as I said, that really gave me all the knowledge because I studied and studied and studied. I mean, I really, I knew it, it was not the same because when you're in university at the vet school, you study, but at least for me, and I, I guess in the United States, it's different. Probably university is very different to what I experienced 30 years ago in Spain. But for me, it was just, uh, I need to study because I need to qualify. And that was it. And then I finished university um, and that's when my career started, really. When I started learning about veterinary medicine, for me, university was just something I had to do to get my DVM, and that was it. Um, so um, what I learned at the residency, that I really studied knowing what I was studying it for. I had the cases with me, so I would have several cases in the world, and if I knew what to do, I had to go upstairs, get my books, go to the library, study everything I could, and then go back downstairs and, and follow what I learned and also go through everything with the students. It was a very fun time of my life because I was one or two years older than my students, not more than that, because I started the university when I was very young. Um, so it was, a, it was good fun, but it was also um, a lot of responsibility because you know I was meant to teach them everything I knew uh, so I had to know everything so I could pass it to them. So that was really good. Um, I think a good decision was to dare going into the residency. I mentioned that I still sometimes when I think how I dared doing that, I, I was not ready for that. I was I'd never been in exotic animal clinic. Uh, I'd never been in zoo animal clinic. And I had done a year of clinics, a year and a half, not more than that. So I think it was a bit early for me, but I went for it. And the the um, the head of the exotic animal clinic believed in me and gave me the opportunity. And I think it went very well. And for me, um, yeah, for me, I think it was the best one of the best decisions I made in my in my career. It's uh, strange because I never considered studying medicine, human medicine, because I thought it was a lot of study. You have to go through university and then you have to do more studies and then your residency. And and I've ended up doing exactly the same, but in veterinary, in veterinary medicine. And, and you know, I, I enjoyed it very much. And the other really great, well, not decision, because it wasn't a decision, but I guess a setback that turned out to be actually the best decision I've ever made was to go back to Spain. And that was due to a personal, that was for personal reasons. So it had nothing to do with my professional career. In fact, after the residency, I was already kind of sure that I was going to Chester Zoo to continue working there. But for personal reasons, I went back to Spain. I went to this uh, Marine Animal Rescue Center. And the fact that, you know, that completely changed my career. I was going in one direction and completely changed into another direction. But I'm very glad it did because I think conservation work is, is, is something that I enjoy doing very much. Um, when I finished my residency, it was, and this is going to be very personal, I'm not saying it's not worth it at all, no? I'm not at all, but the way I, I lived everything, working at the rescue centers, at the zoos, at the exotic animal clinic, I just wasn't happy with any of them. It, it was my dream for all my life. And then when I could do them, I just, it, it wasn't satisfying. Um, I didn't like exotic animal clinic because most of the animal that came to the clinic, it was because the owners didn't care about the animals properly. They just couldn't take the time to learn how to look after an animal, you know, how to properly feed the guinea pig or put an UV light to the iguana or do enrichment to a parrot. Uh, and we ended up treating animals that should have been fine. It was just the, 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 the owners were the ones that... Uh, the the cause for the problems uh, and that was very disappointment disappointing and very frustrating uh, at the zoo it was something similar it's not that the zoo wasn't trying of course you know they're getting better and better and they they care much better for their animals but uh, most of the work at the zoo you look after animals that have problems because they're in captivity so 
you know that you're treating an animal that in a few months time you will be treating it for the same thing because they are in captivity there's not much more you can do uh, and that was also very frustrating and in the rescue center what well, it's what i explained before i was looking after 100 animals 100 sea turtles every year but 20,000 were being affected by fisheries so it just made no sense for me to to stay at the rescue center it was good for me for my veterinary clinic uh, work but uh, I just didn't feel I was making a change at all. Um, and um, so turning to conservation, I do miss the surgery. I do miss the clinics, obviously. I'm not doing any of that now. Uh, and I'm losing all my skills, and I know it. But I am much happier by doing what I'm doing now. So that was a great setback uh, that actually I'm really glad that happened. That was really interesting. Um, now I was wondering if you could share what are some of the most rewarding aspects of your career? Yeah, well, that's very clear. I mean, for once, it would be sea turtles uh, and being able to actually play, I think, play a role in, in, in sea turtle conservation. Um, as I told you before, I mean, thousands of sea turtles are being captured by accident every year by fishermen. So the fact that we can do something with them, working with them to reduce that capture and to reduce the impact it, it has on the animals, for me is, is really rewarding. But the other thing is actually working with the fishermen uh, and the personal relation that, that you get to have with them. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not so much talking about, uh, even so, but the big industrial, fleets that if you want might make a lot of money i'm not sure about that but you know just the artisanal fishermen or semi-industrial fishermen that go out that's the way of living uh to to care for the families that's the way of bringing fish to us uh and that from a health perspective is actually really good really interesting so working with them to be able to continue that fishing activity in the most sustainable way because i think it is possible I think it's very interesting and actually spending time with them on the on the fishing vessels and this is a trawler for example in Brazil um, and having time to speak to them and they explain you about their lives why they are working there what they tell you about their families back on land that they don't see for months uh, and it's really a tough a tough job and it's incredible that anybody would want to do it so I have a lot of respect for them and I realize that we're we are very lucky, uh, the ones that work on land, because it's really, really a tough, a tough job. And it's, for me, it's very rewarding working with them and, and try to help them to to continue with their activity. Yeah, that's real. That's really inspiring. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you believe the profession has changed during the span of your career and how you and other successful vets have adapted to this. Yeah, well, for me, and I mean, think that I went to university 30 years ago, huh? so a long time ago. But for me, the, the main change has been the technology development uh, in veterinary medicine. When I was at university, I, I think I saw an ultrasound scan once. Uh, that was it. Uh, I never saw a CT scan or an MRI scan or anything like that being done on, a, on an animal. It was just x-rays, so everything was very uh, very basic and without a lot of technology, really. And seeing now how that has evolved, I mean, um, even I am now using ultrasound scans. I never thought I would learn, but in the past, in the past seven years, um, I, to, I just had to learn to use them because it's, uh, it's very easy. You know, the new technology allows you to really have a much better look into the animal that you cannot do without without using things like that and of course i'm not talking about surgery and new new technology that can be used for surgery or for treatment because i'm because i'm not in that field anymore I, I don't even know about it but probably the 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 curriculum you have now in 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 veterinary medicine at the vet school is completely different to what i learned back 30 years ago and i think that's great because what i what i I, you know, my, my only adaptation has been to learn to use an ultrasound scan, which is, which is not a lot, but in conservation, that's all I need. But talking to other 
sea turtle vets that work in in, in rescue centers, uh, you know the, the 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 technologies and the methodologies that they they talk about. I I don't even know why they mean what they mean. So um, I think that's an advance an advance a very a very clear advance in veterinary medicine uh, and something that for sure a new generation has to embrace. You have to embrace because it's it it makes animal care so much better. You know, it improves everything so much. It makes it easier for the vets to diagnose and easier to, to treat the animal or it improves things that you couldn't treat before that you can probably treat now. So for me, I think that's that's one of the main, uh, main um, how it's changed, you know, how it's, how it's advanced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your perspective. That's super interesting. Um, I'm curious, what originally drew you into the veterinary profession? Well, I've since I was a little kid, I've always really liked animals. Uh, so I, I always knew I wanted to work with wildlife. That's for sure. I was never very really clear if I wanted to be a vet or if I wanted to be a biologist. Uh, and I doubted till the end. But I am very interested in medicine, too. So in the end, that's why I went for uh, veterinary medicine. Also, to be very practical, back then in Spain, it wasn't the best time of, of, of history. It was, you know, a big economic crisis. We always have economic crisis in Spain. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of work around. And, and to, to be a biologist meant you would have no work at all. So I thought if I studied veterinary medicine, it would be easier. If I didn't get my dream of working with wildlife, at least to get a job. Uh, would be easier studying veterinary medicine. But I, I love animals and I love medicine. So it was the perfect combination for me. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, what would you consider to be more valuable in your career, your education or your experience? My experience by far. As, as I said, I was, I guess, unlucky that university back then in Spain, uh, education wasn't you know, had nothing to do with what it is now. There was hardly any practical. So I I did learn a lot. It wasn't a bad university. It was a good university for Spain for then, but it was all based on theory. So and learning by heart. So it was only through experience that then I could, I did realize what everything that I learned, what, what, what was worth for, what, you know, how I could use it. Um, so I consider that I learned to be a vet after university, when I started doing, uh, you know, working with animals. Um, so yeah, for me, it was, it was experience for sure. But, um, you know, then looking at university in Edinburgh, for example, which was later, the amount of experience they got, the, 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 the final years that were with me were much better prepared when they left university than when I left university, for sure. Yeah, that's super interesting and that's very helpful. Um, one last question. What do you think are some of the common mistakes that early career veterinarians make? Well, I'm only going to say, well, maybe two. Um, the main one uh, that I also fell in is as soon as you know a little, to think that you know everything. And that's a very common mistake, I think, because when when you when you know this uh, and you don't realize that it's all this, you think that this is everything. So you're very sure that if an animal is coughing, it's because it's got tracheitis, because that's everything there is. And then you realize that it's another myriad of things that could happen that makes an animal cough. Um, so that can be, if you're only a student, you know, be, that's all right. It's no problem because you're not going to hurt anybody or any any animal. But if you're in clinics already, um, you have to be careful. Realize that you might not know all uh, and be very humble and just study, 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 study. This is a profession, at least if you if you work with clinics, where you can never stop studying. So if you're not ready to keep uh, advancing in your education all all your life, then it's probably better that you don't do this because you really need to advance and to and to improve what you know and it's always evolving um and the other one um goes is completely on the opposite side to be humble too humble and not take opportunities because you think you're not prepared um 
because I think that would be a mistake. And a lot of people, I've seen some of my students that do not take opportunities because they uh, they think they're not ready or because they are in, in other countries or, you know, they feel very uh, insecure. And that I think that's a pity because that's losing opportunities and you don't get many opportunities in your life. So if you really know where you're going, then you really should, you know, just don't let anything stop you. That's great advice. Thank, um, thank you so much for chatting with me today and sharing your no amazing problem. experiences and your perspective. You have had such a wonderful journey as a veterinarian, and I wish you continued success in your career. Thank you very much for the interview. That was very interesting. <laughs>